Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome to the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall. I'm Robert McBride, and this is Carlos Calmer, music director of the Oregon Symphony. Hi, good evening. If you've ever been sitting here listening to something and had the thought, what this symphony needs is more cowbell. We've got the music for you tonight. Mahler Symphony Number no. 7 has more cowbell action than any symphony in the known universe. And there will be 10 cowbells in use tonight, on stage and off. And off, yeah. And off, yeah. Well, I famously, actually, I remember the, which is the other symphony that uses cowbells? I don't know, number nine, I think. Extensively, I remember yelling friend, in friendly way to the, um, to the percussion section who does the cobbles, I said, I need more cows! <laughs> and this week I actually said, the cows are too loud. Oh. Congratulations. Uh, there is progress. I need more cows, that's funny. What would that be in German? <laughs> well, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> ich brauche mehr Kühe. I like it. <laughs> so you and this wonderful orchestra performed Mahler 7 2006, I think. So it's been a while. Yeah. Um, any different approach this time or the same? What? Well, the approach, I think, is uh, very different. First of all, uh, the orchestra is, it's a, this is a different orchestra. I mean, the people in the, playing in the orchestra, I, would, I don't actually know. There are people who actually care for statistics and stuff like that. Probably more than half of the orchestra wasn't there. Um, and uh, the orchestra also got to... A f we are playing at a very different level. I mean, uh, needless to say, uh, which is not a criticism of anything that happened, back in the days, but at the, back in the days, Mala 7 was, was difficult to put on the stage. I mean, it was, it was pushing the orchestra to the limit. And the same thing happens, of course, tonight and the next two nights, but for a very different reason, because the pushing for the limit is just to get not only the greatest excellency possible, but also because any sound, any interpretational idea can be now pushed to the limit. And I mean, this is an orchestra now that for, I mean, yeah, it's still getting better and better, but uh, for maybe two, three seasons, whenever you present something to them that is completely insanely difficult, they are like, okay, what? Um, next? Aren't we lucky? Yeah, <laughs> we are. I want to point something out. Cows? <laughs> oh yeah, there's more cowbells back there. Ohm glocken. Mahler knew them as. It's a little microphone here by a violin stand. Ah. What the heck? And then there's and then another there's... little microphone here over by a viola stand. Well, <laughs> in the fourth movement of this five movement work, Mahler tosses in in just that movement, a guitar and a mandolin. And I got here tonight and I asked who the guitarist would be, and it's going to be Peter Frajola, who's been the what, associate concert master for years and years. I didn't know he played the guitar. So in that movement, he's going to play the guitar. Well, the thing is, in this orchestra, we have people of many talents. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And Kenji Bunch will set down his viola to play the mandolin. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because, yes, he plays the mandolin, then he plays the viola, and on the side, he, yeah, he composes. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and you've brought in a horn player all the way from Alabama to play the solo... Because he is absolutely the tops. That euphonium, yeah. tenor tuba, that yes. kind of stuff. So at the very beginning of the symphony, Mahler writes a solo for... What did he call it in the score? Tenor Juan. Yeah. And then... It's a euphonium in so our case. In our case, it's a euphonium. Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah, Demari is a player who, 
I think he's, he's actually a professor at the University of Alabama, but I know him because he has been here for other pieces and he's the man to go. When an orchestra actually doesn't have a player um, who can play this uh, Mahler 7. And so it's very obvious and he, he's very, very happy to be here because he knows us and he really likes it here. And tonight's concert is being recorded for broadcast on All Classical Portland. That's why there's so many microphones around. So our friends from Sound Mirror in Boston coming back to do their usual incredibly excellent work. So please be particularly quiet. Not, I mean, I, want, I don't want to say it's not really necessary, but come on. This Mahler symphony is in the outer movements, movements one and five. It's so much power. I mean, it's like, whoa. Uh, so, yeah, don't cough nonetheless, but yeah, and in the middle there are, uh, it's actually structurally an interesting symphony because the outer movements are not only the longest, but they're also the ones with the most uh, substance and movements two and four kind of match each other because they are being called night music. You could translate that into serenades and then in the middle is uh, this very weird and very uh, kind of strange scherzo. And I've been reading about this symphony this week and listening to several different performances. And one guy opined that the third movement scherzo sounds diseased. <laughs> I thought that was a little extreme, but it was interesting. <laughs> the thing with this, I mean, Aaron, you, you don't even start. Um, uh, so, if we can take a little bit of a look at Mahler's work. So, Mahler's work, for the most part, uh, is purely symphonic. He wrote symphonies, he wrote a couple of art songs and song cycles, but that's pretty much it. There is nothing else in his over. And in his symphonies, it's from the first symphony until the not finished tenth, it's all about the struggle of the individual human being who goes through hell, heaven and everything in between until at the end of the symphony something happens and uh, as Mahler's life progresses the end of those symphonies is actually death in different forms because at the beginning first symphony, even second, it's actually third, it's actually very positive, it ends with something sublime and big and triumphant at times, etc. Force is a little bit of a weird case because it's for Mahler a small symphony, etc., etc. And this rule of, it's the struggle of the individual fighting what we call life, uh, has one exception. One symphony simply does not fit in that, and that's the one you are hearing tonight. It, it's not exactly that it ha might have elements of that mainly in the first movement, but the rest actually it's very, very different. And um, this symphony, for many reasons, one of them being it's kind of ambiguous music and it's sick third movement, um, has always enjoyed less attention, while all the others have been played over and over, including number 10 that he didn't finish. Number 7 always was like on the side, uh, people who didn't want to touch it. Maybe in the last five, six years it's been played a little more in concert halls, but this is kind of your, your stepchild in some way. And I always, for God knows what reason, <laughs> because I like this piece, I always had a very deep uh, love for stepchildren in general. I always like pieces that, uh, yeah, be, because my thinking, aside from my own musical uh, imagination that I might have for a piece, is always, well, uh, you, my audience, uh, you don't need to hear Beethoven 5. I know you need to hear Beethoven 5, but you don't need to hear it all the time. So let's take one of the Beethoven symphonies that is not being played all the time, one of his stepchildren, if there are any, and let's not play Dvořák 9 
all the time because number six is also a masterpiece, etc. And so, and so I came probably, I mean, I came fairly young to number seven in Mahler and I'm sure if I would even half listen to what I did to that symphony when I was barely 30 years old, I would say like, oh my God, get the guy out of here. No idea how to do this. But I mean, now I'm a little older. <laughs> and a little wiser. I wanted to ask you about Mahler. We know a lot about Mahler, the man. He was very neurotic. He was death obsessed, especially after he found out that he had a heart condition, which eventually killed him. He was, he was a miserable guy some of the time, and he had lots of very up and down emotions internally and external events in his life as well. So you bring all of that knowledge when you open the score. How much are you thinking about that kind of stuff, or are you just working with what's on the page? Well, <laughs> I try first of all to work with what is on the page. Um, because, especially in Mahler symphonies and in Mahler scores, there is so much on the on the page. And I would say that in this habit of Gustav Mahler of slightly overmarking everything, he doesn't leave anything to interpretation, or not so much to interpretation. Uh, you you actually can trust Mahler very well, and I think that the sevens is even more marked than others. I mean, God, every bar has seven things that you have to do at the same time. It drives you, it drives you a little bit crazy. But um, there are interesting things in this Mahler symphony overall in terms of what you read, because, uh, and I give, want to just to give you a glimpse at the insane things that uh, sometimes I say to an orchestra in order to get a certain expression because you know when you work with an orchestra especially one of this category essentially your language can be very technical uh, louder softer more this more that and, and sometimes in order to get a certain way of how to play it I use things that come to me just like that in the moment. I don't prepare for that. It just happens that I make things up, like I need more cows. Uh, it happened in the morning. I didn't think about it, but well. And this week we were rehearsing the second movement, which is actually anywhere between, um, in part, a, a romantic song and underlying has a certain sense of march, but for Mahler's uh, output, a very kind of tame march. And I said to them, um, because I wasn't getting the accent approach, there are many accents in this movement, that I wanted. And I say, said to the orchestra just in a moment, please play it like a love song uh, sung by somebody who has two reds. It just was a miracle. I mean, they immediately, it immediately changed everything. Yeah, I, I know I'm a weird guy. <laughs> They're going to be talking about these things for years. You know, you remember that time Carlos said, what did he say? It was so weird. Oh, Something about Tourette. Uh, you know, so, uh, the thing is, I, I'm sure that every conductor uh, should be documented. And there, uh, Thomas Beechen, uh, oh yeah, there is, and uh, Otto Kiempera, oh boy. There's a whole catalog of Eugene oh. Ormandy-isms. Yeah, and in a way, yeah, I remember uh, actually when, uh, when Jimmy died and Ron Blessinger um, kind of honored him here on this stage and he talked a little bit about this habit that Jimmy had to say everything has to be very organic, saying that here in Portland where we are like we know the chicken by name that we ate. <laughs> uh, it's like things... Anyway, and in cases like me, yeah, probably over more than 30 years of this profession there can, can be some interesting things that rarely it happens but it happens that you say something 
that it, as I told you, I don't, uh, I don't think about it. It just comes out, and very rarely it happens. It comes out, and you say like, "Oh no!" But sometimes it's helpful. Well, I remember once, for example, I give you an example, and this actually relates to all of you. When I came, <laughs> you know that every Saturday I talk uh, about, a little bit about the piece, and I remember it was second symphony of Schumann and second piano concerto by this. And I came and said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this concert is full of number twos. <laughs> and I didn't know what I said. I just, I actually heard my orchestra dying behind me. <laughs> and later I said, what did I actually say? And okay, they cleared it up. <laughs> or the moment when I, 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 I had a brass chorale and I didn't like the balance between trombones, tuba, trumpets, and horns. And I looked at them and said, I need the sound more horny. <laughs> okay, it's, it comes out. Is anybody taking notes? It would be great <laughs> to have all these things written down. We can trot them out for your farewell in a few years when, you're, <laughs> when your time is up at the Oregon Civity. You love to end seasons with Mahler. Is that for you? Is it for them? Is it for us? Is it for all of us? Why? Yeah, Mahler is very good as a composer. It's a very... It, it, Mahler is not showy per se, but it's a great show. And, and it'll be the first symphony at the end of next season. And in a way, uh, the rule is... Look, the rule when you end a season... There are two, three concerts that have actually rules really strong rules. The first concert, meaning don't play at the end of the concert a requiem that pretty much kills everybody. Second, the concert where your renewals are going to happen. Because, <laughs> like, don't put a downer there. And the last concert, because essentially when we say goodbye to you, uh, as far as this is, I'm, uh, essentially next Tuesday, the Audra MacDonald is here, you should really come. That's a great artist of a very different kind. Anyway, but you also should not... I mean, I don't have a problem with that, but uh, others might have a problem if I say the ending of a season is Mahler 6, and at the end, everybody is dead. It's like... <laughs> bye. <laughs> So, seven is fine. Yeah, seven. Well, yeah, because the last movement is so much fun. And, you know, he's got these night, these three night movements, which are very different. The next to last being a serenade with the guitar and the mandolin, with some shadowy doubts in there. But then the last movement is much more positive in tone, almost throughout, than most Mahler symphonic movements. So it's a fun uh, So the fun thing about Mahler himself is that he thought that this is the happiest, most exuberant symphony that he has ever conceived. And of course, I, uh, who live uh, so much later than Mahler, and look at it, and of course know all the symphonies and uh, some of his personal story, I think, uh, well, you should maybe see a shrink if this is the most exuberant, happiest you can do. Because, but mainly the reason why you say that is movements one, three, and five. Movements two and five, four are, I don't think they are exuberant at all, but be that as it may. But the first movement is actually, has tremendous power and it's, to my understanding, fairly dark, fairly eerie, very, and extremely powerful. It's this, it's one of the movements where, after you've done the movement, you are hopefully satisfied with the result, and then you think, oh boy, I have to do four more movements. <laughs> I want to go home right now to recover from this. And the third movement, the sick one, <laughs> yeah, that's a weird piece, because there is... Uh, it's a scherzo. Scherzo means joke. 
in the original way. And of course, it's in three quarters, so it has similarities to a waltz. But it's a waltz written by Mahler, at, and the waltz only happens at some times and at some points, and then uh, the music gets completely out of hand and is being shut up twice. The first by the timpani hitting a note uh, with triple fortissimo and with wood mallets. And the second time it's, which for mallets time was kind of an innovation uh, with the double basses and celli plucking a string with five Fs, meaning quintuple fortissimo. And he said, please pluck it so that the string um, hits the fingerboard, which we nowadays call Bartok Pizzicato, you'll hear it, it's noisy. <laughs> anyway, and, that, and then it goes on, and then there are... Um, I had to ask my wonderful wife for the tr correct translation, because Mahler is not only full of louder, softer, faster, da, 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 it's also sometimes expressions, wonderful expressions. The, the one expression that comes in many Mahler symphonies and this is, is the word gemütlich. Gemütlich means um, pleasantly relaxed. Happens in this symphony. But then came uh, in the third movement in the oboes the word kreischend. And I didn't know how you translate kreischend uh, and I, so I went to Rafael and said, uh, how do you say when, when one of your children is actually completely out of his mind and screams and, 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 uh, and sobs at the cell? Children, we have a three-year-old. Uh, and she said, wailing. Oh. Wait, wailing, completely, <laughs> oboes doing that. Third movement, no wonder somebody says it's sick. <laughs> and then comes the last movement, and the last movement, um, I still think that I'm maybe not be completely wrong. I think that maybe the fifth movement is the reason why this symphony is not more popular amongst conductors. Um, because the reason why this symphony is not being played more often is essentially our fault. I mean, all we have to do is just program it. And yes, this is a symphony that requires a large orchestra, but there are other symphonies that are larger in size anyway. And the problem with the fifth movement is that it is in a way positive and C major and uh, fast and majestic to an extent that is a little bit unbearable and over the top. That's the problem number one. Uh, sometimes you might think, I don't know, it, you get your own impression, but you might think, uh, well, if somebody screams at you for 15 minutes, be happy, be happy, well, after 10 minutes you're like, uh, get me out of it. Anyway, and the other problem with the last movement is the tempo changes which is technically really hard to do. It's just for the orchestra hard to play and for the conductor really hard, it's not easy. And it's sometimes very abrupt and you don't see it coming because you, we live as musicians with the idea of speed changes during a piece. It's a norm, normal thing. But I would say 90% of the times there are transitions. You go from one tempo into the other and it's very, what Jimmy said, it's very organic. And uh, in this last movement, organic is not there all the time. It's actually, it's a little all over the map and at the end, when finally the triumph of C major is and when the entire brass and the winds and the strings blast through everything and the room is full of cows then we end the symphony <laughs> something like that but that last movement is a rondo so he presents a theme and then he does this other stuff and then we hear the theme again and then some other stuff so th that's one thing to keep in mind when you're listening to it to help it make sense but it is sort of all over the place yes. it, did you have to work when you were rehearsing, did you have to work the most on that? 
probably in the end probably i this look th this is one of the things that happens when you are a little more experienced uh, with the uh, and even with this symphony so this time with the Oregon Symphony, I started rehearsals with that movement because my experience, I've conducted this piece uh, quite a few times and you start always by the first movement. And the problem is the first movement is long and complex and complicated and a lot of stuff to do. And then you do that and then you do the second, third, fourth movement and you realize, oh boy, I only have one hour left of rehearsal time to do the last movement and you are dead because you don't have the time to really do it well. And uh, it happened. That's why I say that the first time I did the seventh, I don't even want to know. Yeah, that's, but this time, start with the last movement, just go after all these very, very many complicated uh, things and uh, then go after the other movements and I think it was uh, um, a balanced time that we had. Symphony rehearsals and recording sessions are very driven by the clock. There's only so much time, musicians union rules stipulate for this much playing, the, the kids in the band have to have this much break time. So everybody's watching the clock. And this is supposedly not a joke. This is not a conductor joke. It is allegedly a true story. Charles McCarris is conducting a rehearsal. He ends one minute early. And he starts to say something to the orchestra, and they don't care. As far as they're concerned, they're done. So they're standing up and packing up their stuff, and making all this noise, and they don't even hear what he says. Next day, they all come together again. And he begins by saying, what I wanted to tell you at the end of yesterday's rehearsal is that this morning's rehearsal has been canceled. <laughs> and I really hope that's a true story. <laughs> now, a couple of things about tonight. As we mentioned, it's being recorded for broadcast, so keep that in mind. There's no intermission. So if you want to fortify yourself with a drink, you can go out and do that now. Recordings for sale on a table in the lobby as usual. And finally, I just have to say that when Gustav Mahler was my age, he'd been dead for 15 years. So there. Carlos Kalmar. Robert McBride. And you. Uh -oh. Whoa.